Um, the production is expected to be in the 20 to 25 TCF range per year going forward. And most of this um, growth is going to come from the Marcellus region um, in the near term. It has, al has already been mentioned today, um, electric utility use of natural gas is growing. And for the first time, we have now surpassed industrial customers in, their, in our use of natural gas. And this trend is only going to continue as there have been 70,000 megawatts of coal-fired plants that have announced that they're going to retire between 2010 and 2022. This is approximately 21% of the 339 gigawatts of coal-fired generation that were in operation in 2010. And this does not include any retirements that are going to occur um, in response to 111D. And so most of these retirements going forward are going to probably be replaced by natural gas and renewables. So as we go forth and continue to have this evolving generation mix and these, um, going forward, what are some of the challenges that we're going to face, especially in the short term, as we make this transition from being relying on coal and other fossil fuels to relying more on natural gas and renewables? And so there's four buckets of challenges that I want to talk about today. And one of them is infrastructure challenges, making sure that we have the pipeline and the transmission and other infrastructure that we need to get these new resources where they need to go. The second one is the market challenges that John talked about this morning, especially in the competitive markets, making sure that the price signals are adequate to incent the new generation where it's needed to be built. Third is the regulatory challenges. Um, rules coming out of EPA, out of FERC, um, DOE, recent interest, um, through the QER. These are all things that are going to add an additional layer of complexity as utilities seek to meet the, meet the um, needs of this growing, evolving generation mix. And then finally, fuel diversity. We, the United States has always had a very diverse fuel source. Are we going to be able to maintain this diversity going forward? One of the lessons that we learned during the polar vortex, especially in the mid-Atlantic and New England region, was that all resources were really needed to keep the lights on. And so if we, as we move, to, if we move away from having this fuel diversity, what does this mean for long-term reliability and long-term resource adequacy? But first, let's take a look a little bit at the EPA regulations. These are just some of the roles that um, we're going to see coming forward in 2015 and beyond um, that the EPA is talking about or considering. I mean, most of these are going to affect the utility industry in some way and are going to affect what types of resources we can use and the cost of, genera of generating electricity. And so just the one, the topic of the moment is obviously 111D. Um, this was already gone over a lot today, so I'm not really going to go into the specifics of um, what 111D requires. But I do want to talk a little bit about some of the potential impacts that we see. And these are only potential impacts. The comments that EEI filed with the EPA on the proposed plan was close to 400 pages. So there are a lot of issues that were raised. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of them. Uh, one of them is the interim transition goal. Um, really, 2020 is viewed by a lot of people as a cliff, um, a time where many of these state goals are going to need to be met. And the concern is, is that there's not going to be enough time to get the infrastructure built that's going to be needed in order to maintain reliability when all these new resources come online. According to the EPA proposal, about 80% of the states need to achieve 50% or more of their state goals by 2020. And there's a large percentage of that 80% that needs to have 75% of the state goals met by 2020. And so the concern really is, one, can it meet those? And if they do, it's going to be primarily by shutting down any coal fire generation that they have. And if, and will that be enough time to get transmission built, pipelines built, natural gas generation built, get renewables um, in a place where they can be connected to the system and serve the system reliably? So there are a lot of concerns with the um, interim time frame. Um, another concern is that there's going to be a, um, an estimated EPA estimates there's going to be 46 to 49 gigawatts of existing coal plus fire plants that will retire uh, by 2030 as a result of 111D. 
This is in addition to the 70,000 megawatts or 70 gigawatts that have already announced retirement. Um, secondly is natural gas and renewables. The question really is, as we've heard earlier today, is can the natural gas combined cycles really meet their 70% um, operational, which, which the EPA plan says they're going to do. There's also a concern with renewables, since a lot of renewables cross state lines. And so the question is going to be, as states formulate their plans, who actually gets credit for the renewable, for these renewables that are crossing straight lines? Is it going to be where it's generated? Is it going to be where it's going to? And so there's a lot of interstate questions involving renewables that are going to need to be answered. And then there were a question asked earlier today about hydro and nuclear. And you know, the question remains as to what's going to be the role of these two resources going forward. We really feel that there needs to be um, increased generation from new hydro needs to be considered, increased generation from existing hydro needs to be considered in the EPA plans, which it currently is not done. Also, nuclear, they assume that there's going to be um, a 6% of existing nuclear plants are going to stay online, or are, I'm sorry, at risk of retiring due to the EPA plan. Um, this might not be a realistic number for many areas of the country. As John mentioned earlier, there are a lot of price formation and market issues in the RTO market. If nuclear plants are not able to recover their costs and operate efficiently, then it's likely that they're going to retire. There's been discussion of that with the Exelon nuclear plants here in Illinois. And so really is the 6% factor really going to be one that's sustainable in all areas of the country? And if not, how does that affect reliability in meeting the state goals in these areas? In addition to the 111D, there's other regulatory challenges that need to be considered. Um, there's going to be new rules for the integrity of the well, uh, which could increase the cost of getting gas out of the ground. There's also going to be possible EPA regulations on fracking, on the methane rules, which John mentioned earlier. There's also some moratoriums in some states against fracking. And so what's the impact of these other regulatory challenges that are specifically geared toward the natural gas industry? What impact is that going to have on gas production going forward and gas costs going forward, especially if we see less use from coal and nuclear and other types of baseload resources. There's also a lot of infrastructure challenges. Um, additional natural gas pipeline is going to be needed to accommodate the increased demand in natural gas. Um, we've talked about some of the challenges in getting these pipelines built. Um, especially in the RTO ISO market, where previously um, gas generators were not able to recover the cost of entering into a long-term 365-day contract for a pipeline if their gas was only going to be used as a peaking unit for a very short period of time. Um, there's also electric, trans electric transmission that's going to be needed to integrate all these new resources, especially the wind coming from the west to the east. And as we've already discussed, there's a lot of increasing public opposition to these infrastructure projects, both gas and electric. And so that's going to increase the time frames that it takes to get these projects permitted, cited, and built. Um, and then the Quadrennial Energy Review, which was just issued in April 2015, um, focused on this and emphasized the need to modernize our energy infrastructure in order to meet this new changing landscape. And the question is going to be, are we going to be able to get it done in time in order to meet the goals that have been set out by the EPA in their proposed rule? So what I'd like to do is just kind of take another layer off this onion, just as it relates to natural gas pipelines. So this chart um, shows where the ma major natural gas supply areas are today, um, where the shale plays are, and where the major gas corridors are today. And so as you can see, there's going to need to be some changes made as to gas flows, where gas pipelines are built, um, to accommodate for where the load centers are, where the shale plays are, where gas is coming from and going to. But, and we are making progress in getting this gas built. According to FERC, 30 new pipelines were placed into service um, in 2014. 
and eight new storage product projects were placed into service in 2014. And so there's a lot of construction going on in terms of building the natural gas pipeline and storage infrastructure that we're going to need. And then all of this new construction is showing that congestion is improving. This chart shows two time periods, one from November 2010 to March 2011, and then the other from November 2013 to March 2014. And as you can see, there's been a substantial improvement um, in congestion. Oh, goodness. Not very technically savvy. Um, well, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there is been, um, a lot of congestion that's been reduced, especially in the areas that have been highlighted over that period of time due to all this new pipeline going into service. But we still have a long way to go. And one of the, and this was adequately demonstrated during the polar vortex, especially in the Middle Atlantic and New England regions, where there was inability to get gas and very high um, gas prices, especially in the PJM region. And there remains a lot of congestion in both the PJM and the New England region when it comes to certain periods of time. And especially in New England, um, you know, John talked about earlier about some of the proposals that they have going on as to how to get new pipelines built. And, PJ, and New England has adopted a new capacity market proposal, a pay for performance proposal, which requires generators to have firms supply and to show up for longer periods of time and have severe penalties if they don't show up when they're needed to perform. Whether this actually translates into long-term contracts or entering into these contracts to get pipelines built remains to be seen since it goes into effect three years from now. And so there's still um, work that needs to be done in getting these pipelines built. Another issue is market challenges. As I talked about before, we have significant regional diversity in terms of fuel mix, market structures, and market rules. This makes it very difficult to adapt to one size fits all approach. And so everything is going to need to be adopted or addressed at the regional level. In the competitive markets in particular, there are questions about who is responsible for the security of fuel, um, for fuel diversity, for managing the fuel supply chain. There's been a lot of capacity reforms that have been adopted in New England. Um, similar ones have been proposed in PJM and are pending before FERC. There's a lot of issues related to price formation in the energy and ancillary services market. Are they adequately providing the price signals that are needed in order for resources to recover their costs and make the investment decisions that they need? There were concerns, especially during the polar vortex, about lack of transparency, about significant amounts of uplift and out-of-market payments that were made to some generators that were not reflected in the LMPs. And, so, and concerns whether the day ahead prices are adequate to reflect it in the real time if they're actually promoting efficient generation and efficient use of the city of the, um, of the system. And then finally, there's gas electric coordination challenges, which are likely to increase as the amount of natural gas used for generation increases. Um, there's the financing issues that we talked about, especially in our TOISL markets, and how do we get gas generators to enter into long-term contracts for pipelines. There's um, the additional flexibility that's needed for gas generation in order to meet the, the peaking supply needs rather than taking 124th of a delivery every hour. The recent FERC rule that did not change the gas day, as John mentioned, did add an extra nomination cycle. But there are some areas of the country which pipelines offer a lot of additional nomination cycles on top of that, and there's other ones that just offer the bare minimum that's required by FERC. And so the question really is, are the pipelines really to increase the options and increase the nomination cycles that are available to gas generators so that they can um, meet the flexible needs of the electric system? And then there's gas availability issues. We saw a lot of that during the polar vortex, where gas was unavailable or hard to find during weekends or during um, off-peak hours. And so this all raises concerns about you know, how the system is going to work and whether and what changes are going to be made, made in order to be efficiently using both the gas and the electric system. So once again, I'd like to put, peel just the layer off the onion on just one of these issues, and this is price formation in the energy market. 
The market in the RTO and ISO market provides the short and long-term price signals that are necessary to sustain and promote investment. And so one of the things that we mentioned at FERC is that involves having accurate energy price formation, fair competitive capacity design, and compensating all resources for the services that they provide to the grid. And so in this way, we think there's going to be more reliability, economic sustainability, and also providing the environmental sustainability that we're moving towards. So just looking at one issue, which is out-of-market payments. Out-of-market payments is one of the issues that's really been a lot of consensus around in the energy industry. The fact that they should be minimized because they interfere with the competitive price signals that are necessary to have effective dispatch and to make effective investment decisions. If there is an out-of-market payment that is made, that payment is not reflected in the clearing price. And those, therefore, those resources cannot respond to that clearing price enough and are not able to show up or be compensated. At the end of the day, this will realize in resources retiring, which could result in more expensive resources being built, which will raise the cost for generation going forward. So one of the things that we've really been working on at FERC and trying to um, encourage them to do is to focus on this issue and to try to get more emphasis paid on getting these price signals correct. There's been a lot of recent legislation that's been introduced um, in Congress. Actually, 12 were introduced in the House and one, 12 were introduced in the Senate and one in the House just on Friday. And they focus a lot on capacity markets and getting RTOs and ISOs into more of an integrated resource planning type role like a traditional state commission does. And so the question really becomes, how is that possible in a market that's based on, our, on economic dispatch and where an RTO doesn't necessarily want to be in the process of picking winners or losers? We already have a lot of fuel diversity, and so the question really becomes, how do we maintain that fuel diversity going forward? Because it really has served a very important role in maintaining system reliability. Um, there was a study done recently by IHS um, in June of 2014 which studied the diversity um, in the U.S. power supply. And they basically indicated that using a base case of the generation that we currently had in 2010 and 2012, through 2012, and then using a projected case where they took out all of the coal, um, all of the nuclear, and substantially reduced the role of the, um, how much hydro was used, they found that wholesale prices in the United States would increase by 75% and retail prices would increase by 25%. As the question really is, how do we maintain the skill diversity, still provide reasonable cost service, and still meet the environmental goals that um, that this that we want to make going forward? And so there's a lot of challenges that we're facing in the short term as we evolve the industry. And so what is our industry doing? Well, we, since 1990, we have decreased SO2 and NOx emissions by 79% and 73%, um, and we have increased electric usage by 35%. As you can see, this chart shows where the, in 1990, where there started to be a difference between GDP and electric usage. And that's really due to the types of customers that are coming online, whether they're industrial or commercial, and the increased technology, um, efficiency of the technology, more demand response, more energy efficiency, um, and those types of things is, what, is what's really causing that change between the GDP and the electric usage. Another thing that we're doing, despite this uncertainty, is we're continuing to invest in the transmission, generation, and distribution infrastructure. In 2014, I think is that we expect to um, conclude that our industry spent $103.3 billion in generation, transmission, and distribution across the United States. And just to give you an idea of how this number breaks down, in 2013, um, of that $90.3 number, 37% was in generation, about 21% was distribution, 17% was transmission, 12% was gas-related infrastructure, 7% was environmental, and 6% was, um, was other. And going forward, what we're going to expect to see is that 
that generation number percentage will go down slightly and the transmission and distribution number will go up slightly as we're building out the resiliency of the system and building the infrastructure that we're going to need in order to meet um, the goals going forward. So this is just um, my concluding thought um, that we're going to continue to provide affordable, reliable, safe, environmentally friendly electricity, but we're only going to need to work with the natural gas industry going forward in order to make that happen. And that includes um, making sure that we can get the shale that we need um, to continue, that that's done in an environmentally and responsible manner, and that we're able to work with the pipelines in order to get pipelines built and in order to get the flexibility that we're going to need um, in order to make that work going forward. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent presentation, thank you. Uh, can you say some more about the legislation that was apparently introduced last week? Sure. Can you think more about those bills? Yeah, sure. So, um, and I'm just kind of looking through them right now, so I can only give you a very um, high point. But there was one bill introduced in the Senate, um, which dealt specifically with capacity markets and RTOs, in which they want to encourage <coughs> RTOs to do reliability planning, get more information from generators as to when they're going to come online, how long they're going to stay online, when they expect to retire, and then to, and then to do some type of integrated resource planning and how they're going to make a diverse portfolio happen. Um, and so it's going to be interesting. That's a discussion that's been going on for a long time as to whether there should be tranches in the capacity markets for certain resources. If you want to have X percentage of nuclear, X percentage of wind, X percentage of gas, um, that's meant a lot of pushback. But at the end of the day, the RTOs do not want to be in the position of picking winners and losers and determining what resources should clear the market. They want to continue to have it done on an economic dispatch basis. A similar um, legislation was introduced in the House Energy Committee um, to the subcommittee. It contains, it's 50 pages long and it has a lot of different provisions and there is a provision in there that's very similar to the one from the Senate on um, capacity markets. There were a lot of bills introduced related to cybersecurity and there were also some bills introduced, I think like four or five, that specifically related to distributed generation and um, having them interconnect with the grid in the same manner as other resources, um, not having any barriers to their um, to distributed generation, which included you know, rooftop solar as well as storage, energy efficiency, demand response. It was, it was a very large list of what they considered to be distributed generation. Um, and the other thing, they also talked about net metering, um, the rates that needed to be charged, that they needed to be fair. Um, some of the bills actually had a number in there that the utility couldn't charge more than X amount for the fixed cost of the system. And so, you know, there, and these are all competing bills that came out of the Senate Out of the Energy Committee. So it'll be interesting to see how they go forward. Um, tomorrow, there's actually going to be the first hearing on the distribution and infrastructure bills, which includes the net meter and DG bills. Um, next Tuesday on the 19th, they're going to have a hearing in the Senate Energy Committee on the bills or bill related to the capacity markets and the wholesale markets. And so this process, and these bills are just introduced on Thursday and Friday in the, of last week. So they're obviously moving fast. And so what the next stage is, um, we're going to see. We're currently getting input from our members. And so uh, formulating our positions, and I'm sure we'll be active as much as we can be given the diversity in our um, membership at the Hill level. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. This is the lunch break. Um, there is lunch served uh, down the hall. Um, we'll reconvene uh, at a little bit after one. Oh, one thirty, yeah, a little bit after one thirty. <laughs>